Today I'm going to be speaking to you about some joint work I carried out with Stephen Piddick, Johannes Bausch and Toby Cubitt, looking at the theory of Hamiltonian simulation and in particular studying universal Hamiltonians. Throughout this talk I'm going to be talking about analog simulation, not digital simulation. So what we're interested in is directly engineering a Hamiltonian of interest and measuring its properties experimentally, not using a quantum computer to run an algorithm. So the obvious classical example of this sort of analog simulation is building an aerofoil and studying its dynamics in a wind tunnel. And just as it's easier to study a scale model of an aerofoil in a wind tunnel than it is to study an entire aeroplane, the advantage of artificially engineering a Hamiltonian that models a material of interest is that typically it's easier to measure and manipulate the artificially engineered system. So it's been shown that within a very demanding definition of what it means for one Hamiltonian simulate another, there exist universal models, and these are families of Hamiltonians which can simulate all other quantum medieval physics. So the inspiration for the work studying universal Hamiltonians originally came from work studying analogous results for classical Hamiltonians. And in the classical setting, it was possible to prove a deep connection between complexity and Hamiltonian simulation. So essentially it was shown that if a family of Hamiltonians has a ground state energy problem that is MP hard, then it is necessarily also capable of simulating the complete physics of any other classical Hamiltonian. Now there have been hints that a similar connection holds in the quantum case. So the classes of two qubit interaction that are universal for simulating classical, stochastic, and general Hamiltonians respectively have been fully characterized. And it's been shown that they coincide precisely with the classes of interactions that have NP, Stockholm A, and QMA complete ground state energy problems respectively. However, the previous of these quantum classifications relied critically on having only two qubit interactions. And the more complicated structure of quantum Hamiltonians meant that it was impossible to replicate the classical approach to proving a relationship between complexity and simulation. So this begs the question, is there a general link between complexity and simulation in the quantum case, or is it just a coincidence for the two qubit interactions? And in this work, we resolve this by deriving a new method of proving universality of quantum Hamiltonians. Unlike previous approaches, it doesn't require perturbation gadget techniques, and instead it relies on the ability to encode computation into the ground states of local Hamiltonians. So our main result is that a family of Hamiltonians is a universal quantum simulator, if and only if its ground state energy problem is QMA complete under faithful reductions, and the model is closed where we say that a reduction is faithful if it maps the subspace picked out by a particular verification circuit to the low energy subspace of the Hamiltonian. And I'll define this, this condition more precisely later in the talk. And we say the model is, is closed if given two Hamiltonians acting on possibly overlapping sets of QDIS A and B, which are in the model, there exists a third Hamiltonian also in the model, which can simulate the sum of the initial two Hamiltonians. So this is kind of the main result of our work. We also, um, in this work, derive two new, um, two new constructions of translation of uh, universal models um, using, using our new method for proving universality. So those are kind of the main results. In the rest of the talk, I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of Hamiltonian simulation and previous universality results. I'm then going to give a sketch of the proof for our for our two new universal models, which are both transition variant universal models in one dimension. Um, and hopefully um, giving some concrete examples of how our, how our new construction, of how our new uh, proof technique works will help to um, help give some insight to those general conditions, which I'll talk about the proof for that uh, next. Okay, so firstly, what is Hamiltonian simulation? So obviously to simulate some target Hamiltonian H, the simulator Hamiltonian H prime, we're going to need to encode the physics of the target Hamiltonian into a subspace of the simulator Hamiltonian in some way. So in an early paper, two of my co-authors rigorously defined what these encodings have to look like. And the way we did this was come, by coming up with a list of operational requirements that you want the mapping of one Hamiltonian into another to satisfy if it's going to be called a simulation. So things like preserving the energy levels, partition function, measurement outcomes, time evolution, and other operational requirements like that. And from these operational requirements, they were able to pin down the form that encodings have to take. Um, and what they showed is that encodings must be of this form here, where V is an isometry and P and Q are integers. So up to isometries, 
any encoding of one Hamiltonian into a subspace of another, which forms the basis for a simulation, must just be equal to a number of copies of the target Hamiltonian and a number of copies of its complex conjugate. So the encodings as defined here map the physics of a target system into a subspace of the simulator system. And typically the subspace we're interested in mapping into is the low energy subspace of the simulator system. So with this in mind, we can define the simulation as follows. We say that H prime perfectly simulates H below energy cutoff delta. If there is a local encoding into this subspace, such that this subspace is exactly equal to the low energy subspace of H prime, and that H prime restricted to the low energy subspace is equal to the, um, the encoded version of H. So below the energy cutoff delta, the two Hamiltonians are equal. Um, above the energy cutoff delta, the target Hamiltonian H doesn't have any energy levels. So um, all the energy levels of the target Hamiltonian lie below this energy cutoff delta. The simulated Hamiltonian, on the other hand, might have a load of junk energy levels above, above the R energy cutoff delta. Um, but we're not interested in those. For the purpose of simulation, we're only interested in the low energy subspace of our uh, simulated Hamiltonian. Um, you might have noticed that I stuck an extra, extra word into this definition. So we don't just require that this encoding exists and has form set out in the previous slide. We also require that it's local. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, a local simulation is one that preserves the tensor product structure of the system of interest. So what I mean by that is that local observables are encoded locally, and we don't have to measure the entire system to interrogate a local observable. So what we want is that for any given QDIT in the target system, there is a fixed subset of QDITs in the simulator system which map onto that QDIT. So if we're in the low energy subspace, then for any operator or observable acting on QDIT A in the target system, there is a corresponding um, operator observable acting just on the set of QDITs A prime in the simulator system. Um, okay, so that's what we mean by a local encoding. Um, and we've defined a perfect simulation. But of course, in the real world, no operations are perfect. So we need to allow some approximation um, in our definition of simulation. And in order to allow this approximation while still comparing operators that are supported in the same space, we need to introduce two encodings into the definition of approximate simulation. So these encodings uh, we'll call E of M and E tilde of M. So E of M here is a local encoding. Whereas E tilde, we don't require that E tilde is, has any locality. So you can think of uh, the local encoding as being the one we have access to, the one we understand. So if we're you know, doing our simulation in the lab, we'll use the mapping between target system and simulator system defined by a local encoding in order to, in order to tell us you know, what operations to do, what measurements to make. Um, the non-local encoding E tilde, we don't necessarily have access to it. We might not understand it or know the form it takes, but we know it exists. We know it maps into the right subspace. And crucially, we know that it is close um, in a kind of mathematic, mathematically rigorously sense to the local encoding. Okay, so with that in mind, the, we're gonna say that a, a Hamiltonian H prime is an approximate simulation of our target Hamiltonian H if this non-local encoding maps exactly into the low energy subspace of our target Hamiltonian, and if, I'm oh sorry, of our simulated Hamiltonian, and if, our, and if the low energy, um, if, our, if our simulated Hamiltonian restricted to the low energy, um, the low energy uh, subspace is close in operator norm to, our, to the encoded version of our target Hamiltonian. And we're here, the, the encoding we're interested in is a non-local encoding, um, but remember that the non-local encoding is close to the local encoding. And what was shown in this in initial work looking at simulation and universal Hamiltonians was that if, a, um, if these conditions are met, then all, all important physical quantities are approximately preserved by the simulation. Okay, so that's definition of simulation. As I mentioned in the introduction, we say that a family of Hamiltonians is universal if for any target Hamiltonian H, so any Hamiltonian you can write down, there exists a Hamiltonian in H prime which can simulate H approximately. 
Um, and if we want the simulation to be efficient, we can also enforce that the simulation overhead in terms of number of spins and the norm of the system is polynomial in the accuracy of the simulation. So there's been some previous work from constructing universal Haltonians. So in their original work, um, Toby Cubitt, uh, Ashley Montanaro, and Stephen Piddick, so that there are some really simple spin lattice models, including the 2D Heisenberg and XY models, which are universal. Um, but it's important to note that all the universal models constructed in this paper required the ability to tune individual interaction strengths in the Hamiltonian. And then last year, um, Stephen Pinnock and Johannes Bausch constructed the first translationally invariant universal model. Um, although it's, it should be noted that this model isn't efficient um, in terms of normal simulator system or the number of spins in the simulator system. Um, and all of these previous universality results required using complicated chains of perturbation gadgets to prove universality. And it wasn't clear how to derive a classification of universal models using these perturbation gadget techniques. And that's why we developed our, our new method for proving universality. So as I mentioned in the introduction, before we delve into the proof of the general conditions of universality, we're going to try and gain some intuition for how our new method for deriving universality works by, um, by looking at our, our proof of two new universal models, which are both translation invariant models in one dimension. So, so the, the basis of our new method of proving universality is that we can encode computation into the ground states of local Hamiltonians using history states. So as I'm sure you all know, history states are quantum states which encode the history of quantum computation. Now, in both the universal models we're going to be talking about in this section, um, the, the, con the computation we're encoding is computation in the quantum Turing machine model. And the reason this is the quantum Turing machine model is nice is because it gives you um, translation invariance for free. So when you encode um, a quantum Turing machine model into a history state, what you get is a um, translation invariant Hamiltonian acting on a chain of spins, um, where the interactions in this um, translation invariant Hamiltonian are nearest neighbor, and they, they enforce that the, the, um, the history state kind of encodes a valid computation by the, by encoding the transition roles of the Turing machine in these um, in these in, in the interactions of this Hamiltonian. So these kind of quantum Turing machine history states are going to form the basis of our two new universal models. Okay, so that's the model of computation we're going to be encoding. But what's the actual um, what's the actual computation that will be encoding using this um, using this method? Well, the computation we're going to be encoding is a phase estimation um, algorithm. So the Turing machine at the beginning of the computation, the Turing machine tape at the beginning of the computation is going to look like this. We've got a description of our target Hamiltonian. We've then got some uh, some part of, on some on the first part of the tape. We've then got the second part of the tape, which which contains the description of the physical spins. So when I say the physical spins, I mean um, these contain a description of the state on the target system that we're interested in simulating. And then the rest of the Turing machine tape is blank. So what the Turing, what the computation does is it reads in the um, state, the reason the description of the target Hamiltonian, then it reads in the state of the physical spins, and then it carries out the phase estimation algorithm. So that at the end of the computation, what it outputs a number of kind of what we'll call flag states, A and B, and the number of these flag states um, maps onto the energy of the state psi with respect to the target Hamiltonian H. Um, okay, so that's the computation that we encode um, on this Turing machine. The universal Hamiltonian is then of this form here, given in equation five. So HPE here is a history state Hamiltonian. So the ground state of um, HPE um, corresponds to a history state which, which encodes a history of this computation. So it's a highly entangled state which, um, which encodes the history of this computation. And we, we multiply HPE by a large delta penalty delta, a large energy penalty delta. So what that enforces is that the low energy, um, the kind of the low energy state of this, of this uh, universal Hamiltonian um, is, is close to this history state. 
And the second term in this um, second term in this Hamiltonian is a projector. And what this does is it gives just the right amount of energy to these flag states, so that the energy of these history states um, with respect to this universal Hamiltonian is equal to the energy of this state psi with respect to the target Hamiltonian. So using this um, a universal Hamiltonian of, the, of this form, as I've said, its energy states will, um, sorry, its energy eigenvalues will be approximately equal to the, to the energy eigenvalues values of the target Hamiltonian. But obviously in simulation, we're not just interested in the, um, in getting the right um, energy levels. We also want to be able to investigate the, investigate the full physics of the target Hamiltonian. Um, and this, this method doesn't quite achieve that. And the reason for that is that this simulation isn't local. So in the kind of initial configuration of the Turing machine, we do have um, a portion of the Turing machine tape, which corresponds to the, which corresponds to the um, physical state of the target system. Um, but the history states are highly entangled. Um, and what that means is that there's no, once you get the kind of the full history state, there's no um, there's no local mapping from the state from the from the state of the target system to the state of the simulation system. Um, but fortunately, there's a way to overcome that, and the idea is actually very very simple. The idea is just that before carrying out the computation, we're going to have the Turing machine idling in its initial state for some long time L prime. Um, so when we do that, the, the state of the history, the history state takes this form. And you can see that with high probability, the simulator system is in the state corresponding to the initial configuration of the Turing machine. So that means with, with high probability, there is a there is a fixed subset, subset, subset sorry, of spins in the simulator system, which whose states map on to the to the um, state of the target system. And what that means is that. And this kind of um, this kind of mapping where we've got a fixed subset of spins which map onto the state of the target system, this is, this is a local encoding like what I defined earlier. Um, now the encoding isn't exactly local because it's only with high probability that we're in this um, in this state corresponding to the initial configuration. But remember, we don't need everything to be exact. We only need we only need our our um, simulation to be approximate. Um, and this 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 um, this method achieves achieves the definition of approximate simulation that I met earlier. So more rigorously, the local encoding is just encoding, just encodes onto this initial initial state of the Turing machine. So all we do is um, add a load of ancillaries which encode the um, the clock register. Uh, the non-local encoding is encoding which maps into the full history state. Um, and if we, if we didn't have this idling to enhance coherence, these two encodings would be very far apart from each other. But what, idling to, what this idling um, ensures is that these two encodings are very close to each other. And that means we have an approximate simulation. And I should say this idea of idling to enhance coherence isn't, isn't something we came up with. It's been used previously by Dorita Haranoff and Leo Zhao in their paper from a couple of years ago. Okay, so with this kind of idling to enhance coherence idea, we're able to construct a, a full um, simulation of our target Hamiltonian using this history state method. Um, as I said before, the universal Hamiltonians are of this form, and the kind of the the local encoding maps onto this initial state of the target of the um, Turing machine. This is something I kind of haven't really touched on, and that's how how do we encode the description of the target Hamiltonian in in the simulation. So I've put a description of the target Hamiltonian here on the Turing machine tape. I haven't really touched on how we actually how we actually um, get that description of the target Hamiltonian. And the way we do it is we can encode a description of the target Hamiltonian into a property of the simulator system. And then what we do is we dovetail two computations together. The first computation extracts the description of the target Hamiltonian and writes that on the Turing machine work tape. And then the second computation is a computation I already outlined, which reads in this target, reads in the description of each target, reads in sight, and then carries out the phase estimation algorithm. Okay, so how do we actually go about encoding our description of each target into a property of the simulator system? 
Well, no, as you might have guessed, there are two methods we use, which correspond to our two new uh, universal models. So the first idea is that we can encode the description of the target Hamiltonian into the binary expansion of the length of the simulated spin chain. So then the, the first computation in our kind of two dovetailed computations is a binary counter Turing machine. So what it does, the binary counter Turing machine, okay, as the name suggests, it um, counts the number of spins in the spin chain and it writes out, um, it, the output is on the length of the spin chain written in binary. And because we've encoded a description of each target into exactly a length of spin chain written out in binary, what we end up with is a description of each target written out on the work table of the Turing machine. And the phase estimation algorithm then takes this input. And um, as I described earlier, um, it, it then uh, carries out phase estimation. So the, the really nice thing about this method is that the only, only thing we have to vary in our universal model in order to simulate all quantum physics is the length of the spin chain. The slight drawback of this method is that when we're um, if we want to use this method to simulate non-translationally invariant um, Hamiltonians, what we'll find is that necessarily we end up with an exponential overhead um, in terms of the number of spins of the simulated system. And that's kind of unavoidable and can be seen just by simple counting argument. But um, this is a, it's still a very nice, uh, very nice method. Our second method is to do phase estimation again. <laughs> So the idea here is that we encode the des a description of the target Hamiltonian into a binary expansion of a phase in the Hamiltonian. And then our dovetail computations are two phase estimation algorithms. So the first phase estimation algorithm computes this phase phi in the Hamiltonian, and it, then it outputs phi um, on its work tape. The second uh, computation in our two dovetail computations is another phase estimation algorithm, the one that we outlined earlier, which reads in phi, our description of each target, reads in the state of the physical spins, and then um, carries out the phase estimation to, to achieve simulation. So the really nice thing about, about this model is that it's possible to, um, possible to use this technique to construct a universal model, which is efficient in terms of system size overhead. And because we're using the Turing machine history state construction, the model is also translationally invariant. So what, we'll, what we end up with is a, um, is a first example of a translationally invariant universal model, which is efficient in terms of system size overhead. And we show in our paper, this is implications for complexity theory and also for holography. There's the slight drawback of this method is that we have to, we need the ability to tune this, this um, phase in the Hamiltonian, so there's an extra kind of parameter when you compare it to the binary counter method. So hopefully that's given you some intuition for how these history state simulation techniques work. Um, and also, um, I also outlined um, our two new universal models. Um, in the last kind of few minutes of talk, I want to give a sketch of our proof for general conditions to universality. So we wanted these conditions to be completely general. We don't want statements which only hold to history state constructions. Um, so we're going to move on to talk about a der derivation of general conditions and move away from talking about history states. So first, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the faithfulness condition. So in the intro to the seminar, I said that the faithfulness condition is about mapping the subspace picked out by the verification circuit to the low energy subspace of a Hamiltonian. But how do we get, make this rigorous? So first of all, we define the acceptance operator of, of a verification circuit by this expression here. The conditions are that for every yes instance of the problem, there exists a Hamiltonian in the model such that the low energy subspace of the Hamiltonian is close in operator norm to E of L where L is the subspace of the acceptance operator with eigenvalue less than the completeness probability, and E is some local encoding. And when we say close, what we mean is that this value eta can be made arbitrarily small. And in the, in the paper, we define precisely what we mean by the low energy subspace of the Hamiltonian. Um, the second condition is that the gap in the, in the spectrum of the acceptance of, of, the, um, of the Hamiltonian above this low energy subspace must be some polynomial of the gap in the acceptance operator. So the intuition for the first condition is fairly straightforward to see, um, given the reliance of the simulation definition on local encodings. 
The intuition for why the second condition is useful comes from the fact that we need to push the junk states, which aren't grounded to the history of, um, of our history states, to up to high energies. And if the gap in the spectrum of our, um, of our QMA Hamiltonian above the low energy subspace is too small, then the operator in normal the Hamiltonian blows up very quickly. Okay, so that's a more detailed explanation of what we mean by faithful reduction. And it's worth explicitly pointing out at this stage that the faithful reduction is with respect to a specific verification circuit. So a particular reduction might be faithful with respect to one verification circuit, but not another. Then when we say that a family of Hamiltonians has a ground state energy problem, which is QMA complete under faithful reductions, what that means is that for every instance of the problem and for any polynomial time verification circuit which verifies the problem, there exists a reduction from the instance to the ground state energy problem, which is, with, which is fatal with, with respect to that circuit. Okay, so with that uh, kind of slightly more detailed definition in mind, we can, we can go on to prove our general conditions to universality. So first of all, we're going to um, prove that the conditions are necessary for universality. So closure is clearly necessary. Just as a reminder, closure says that for any two Hamiltonians in the model, there is a third Hamiltonian in the model which can simulate a sum of those first two. And that's clearly necessary because a universal model can simulate all Hamiltonians. So in particular, it can simulate a sum of Hamiltonians within the model. To show that um, in the second condition, so the faithfulness condition is necessary, what we do is we construct a family of Hamiltonians, which are QMA complete under faithful reductions, and then use that any family of Hamiltonians which simulates this must itself be QMA complete under faithful reductions. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, that's not the proof in any detail, it, it just follows uh, via perturbation theory. So the most in, more interesting direction is proving that these conditions are sufficient for universality. And the way we do that is by um, positing some, um, some family of Hamiltonians M, which meets the conditions, and showing using only those conditions that, um, that this family is a universal model. The way we do that is by introducing a problem, which we call yes Hamiltonian. So yes Hamiltonian takes as input a K local Hamiltonian H and outputs yes. And this problem is clearly completely trivial. Um, but we can choose a non-trivial verification for a circuit for it. And in particular, we can choose a circuit that picks out a subspace, which is useful for proving universality. And the subspace is defined by this expression here. Um, mm -hmm. um, and in the paper, I won't go through this in any detail, but in the paper, we show that there exists a verification circuit, which takes, um, which acts on, um, on these witness states, um, and in polynomial time, um, and in polynomial time, it verifies um, it verifies this this problem. Um, so what what this is is a QMA verification circuit, and obviously this verification circuit is a bit it seems a bit pointless because why do we need to verify such a trivial problem? The point is our, our definition of faithfulness. It doesn't just require faithfulness with, with respect to the, to the most obvious verification circuit. It requires faithfulness with respect to any QMA verification circuit. And this, this circuit, I like this slide, which acts on these witness states, is a valid QMA verification circuit. So what that means is that our, um, because our, because our, um, family of Hamiltonians M is QMA complete under faithful reductions, there must be a, um, a Hamiltonian in our, in, our, you know, in our family of Hamiltonians M with low energy subspace satisfying this condition for some local encoding E. And using this along with closure, we can show that um, this Hamiltonian here, H sim, is a simulation of H prime. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the project as much, but basically using yes Hamiltonian, we can also construct, we can use very simply construct any projector. Um, so this probably looks very similar to the history state uh, constructions I, was, I uh, was talking about earlier. The difference here is that HS might, we, we don't rely on um, any kind of history state methods here. All we rely on is, is QMA completeness. 
Um, so we haven't quite finished yet. What we've shown is that this H sim, what we show is that if this H sim is an approximate simulation of H prime. Um, but then we can use the fact that these, um, these witness states, we, we specifically um, constructed these witness states to allow us to prove universality. And what we do in the paper is we then explicitly construct encodings to show that H prime is itself a simulation of H. So just to conclude, what we've done in our paper is we've developed a new method to prove universality of quantum Hamiltonians, and we used it to derive a rigorous connection between universality and complexity. We also use this new method to demonstrate universality of two new models, including the first translation invariant model, which is efficient in terms of system size overhead.